we finished the male physiology and anatomy, so now we're gonna hit on the female. And it is more complicated, I hate to say. And it's more complicated because of pregnancy. And so we've already talked a little bit about this, so we're just gonna review some of this. So ovaries are basically the female gonads and they produce um, the female gametes. And do you remember what gametes are? They're the sex cells, right? And so the female gamete is an ova. Um, it helps in secreting female sex hormones. So can you name what the two sex hormones are? Hopefully you put estrogen, which other forms is estradiol, estron, or estrol, and progesterone and they also have a duct system as well you have the uterine known as the fallopian tubes the uterus and vagina and the last is the external genitalia and just to let you know just like in the men's we're gonna start with the external genitalia first and so the female external genitalia also called the vulva or addendum includes the following. You have the mons pubis, which is that fatty area overlining the pubic symphysis, and you have the lab labia majora, which is that hair-covered fatty skin fold. Now, you do have a counterpart to the scrotum. And basically that's incorporated into the labia minora, which is the skin fold that's lying within the labia majora, and this vesicle area here, which is essentially the recess within the labia minora. Now, if you look, other parts on here include the foreshet. And this foreshet is a ridge that's formed. And basically, it's formed by joining of the posterior vesicle and the labia minora. Now, if you look over to um, the right or left of that, you'll see what's known as the greater vestibular gland. And this is homologous to the bulbo-urethral gland. And basically, this guy helps to release mucus into the vesicle for lubrication. Now, if you look over here, we do have the clitoris, and that's just anterior to the vesicle area there. And what you have is, on here it shows you the glands of the clitoris. So this is the part that's exposed. And the pubis of the clitoria is what hoods the glands. Now these are the counterpart basically of the penis. And then if you look at this diamond shape here, if you remember in the men's, it's the same name, perineum. 
And basically it's this diamond shape. If you remember between back here is the coxy, right? You have the pubic arch over here, and then you have the two ischial tuberosities. And it makes that nice um, kind of diamond shaped area. So that kind of gives you an idea of the um, external genitalia. Now, for the ovaries. Um, within the ovaries, you have follicles. And the ovaries house these many ovarian follicles, which are sac-like structures. Um, basically, each follicle contain, consists of an oocyte, and so this is an immature egg. And it's basically surrounded by follicle cells or granulosa cells. So it's follicle cells if only one layer. is present. And basically, if there's more than one layer present, then it's granulosa cells. And basically, these follicles go through several stages of development. They start with what's known as primordial follicles. And so this is basically a single layer of follicle cells, and I'm just gonna put FC here, plus oocytes. Now, as this becomes more mature follicles, what do you think will happen? Well, if you get more mature, basically then you're gonna have several layers of what? Granulosa cells plus an oocyte. So it's gonna transition. From here, you're gonna have what's known as a vascular or it's known as an antral or actually tertiary, I'm just going to put a three there, follicle. And this is basically a fully mature follicle. And basically there's a fourth here. And this you end up having a fluid filled antrium forms. And basically what this is, is that this is the point where the follicle bulges from the ovary surface. And you can kind of go up here and look at this top picture where you can just see it happening. So here you have that primordial follicle, you have that oocyte, and you just have that single layer that's going around it, right? And then basically after that, you can see that there's a growing follicle here. So this is going to be a more mature follicle, follicle that starts having um, all these um, granulosa cells forming around it and the oocyte. Now if you get over here, you're having that third, the um, vascular follicle. This is fully mature follicle and it's almost ready to um, burst out. And this is Basically, you can see it's starting to bulge here too. That's when you're getting into that um, fluid filled antrum form, so where the, it starts to basically bulge. 
So this is the antrum if you see right there, right? And so that kind of gives you an idea of what's happening and what it looks like. And then it finally releases here during ovulation. And so as we talk about the ovaries, they're actually put into place by several different ligaments. And so here we have, oops, I'm sorry guys, the suspensory ligaments. And these secure the ovaries to the lateral wall of the pelvis. You have the ovarian ligaments. These anchor the ovaries to the uterus. And then you have the broad ligaments, right? And these are folded to the peritoneum that's enclosed and holds the ovary in place. And realize the broad ligaments, that's a broad term because there's several different ones. But we're not going to get into the each individual, but I will show you on a picture what they look like later. Now the blood supply for the arteries um, are from both the ovarian artery and the ovarian branch of the uterine artery. So it gets a blood supply from two places. And basically each ovary is surrounded by fibrous tunica albuginia. Which is then covered by a germinal kind of cubital epithelial layer. And basically this germinal layer is continuous of the peritoneum. So that kind of tells you a little bit about the composition of the ovaries and how they're held into place. Now when we're looking at the ovaries itself, it's made up of a couple of different regions. You both have, if you see here, the cortex or this outer cortex, which this is what houses the forming gametes. And then if you look here towards the middle, just think this is kind of how everything we've looked at. I mean, if you've looked at the lymph nodes or if you looked at the um, kidneys, they always have the outer cortex and the inner medulla, right? And so this inner medulla is a part that contains blood vessels and nerves. And you can see that in there already. Now, what's going to happen in here is this oocyte is going to become a mature egg and then be released. And the ejection of the oocyte from this ripened follicle is what's known as ovulation. And basically, um, once the oocyte is ejected and becomes the ova, What's left of that follicle is what's going to end up turning into what's known as the corpus luteum. And this process, on average, occurs about every 28 days. Now the female duct system, let's get into this. The uterine tube system does not have direct contact with the ovaries. The ovulated oocyte is cast into what's known as the peritoneal cavity, where some oocytes never make it to the tube system at all. And then if they do, the tube system will include the uterine tube, the uterus, and the vagina. And so let's actually talk about the different parts of the tube system. And we're gonna start with first the uterine tube, also known as the fallopian tube or the oviduct. Now this receives ovulated oocyte and is usually the site of fertilization. This is not the site that the cell or the potential um, zygote and offspring become attached to, right? This is just where fertilization happens. Now,
Um, there are different regions within the uterine tube. The isthemus, the ampulla, and infudibulum, which are the three parts I'm going to show you here in a second when we look at the actual uterine tubes. Okay? And so when we're talking about what they're important for, the isthemus is basically this constricted area where the tube joins the uterus. The ampulla is on the distal end of the tube that curves around the actual ovaries. And the infundibulum is the distal expansion that's near the ovaries themselves. Now within this region, they basically have the ciliated fimbrias. And these are going to help create current to move the oocyte into the uterine tube. So basically, these guys receive the oocyte from the ovary. The cilia are basically located inside the uterine tube. And basically, they're going to help to slowly move the oocyte towards the uterus. And this normally takes anywhere from three to four days. So the first one basically takes the oocyte from the ovary and gets it into the uterine tube. The second one Basically, once it's in the uterine tube, it's going to move the oocyte to the uterus. Now, the uterine or fallopian tube has a few functions. So, one, it basically receives the ovulated oocyte, right? And it receives it from the ovaries. It provides a site of fertilization. It empties into the uterus. It basically has little or no contact between the ovaries and the uterine tube. And it's basically supported and enclosed by broad ligaments. So I can almost say these are characteristics more so than function. Let's see. I think is a better word. And so, that being said, let's look at a picture a little bit. And so let's go and talk about the different parts first of the uterine tube. And so you can see it over here. So here is our ovaries. And the fimbria are these little things here. Remember the finger-like structures that help to get it into this area. The infundibulum is that first area that's here that incorporates these guys to help get it in. As you can see from there, it goes to ampulla that goes through here. And then this area right close 
to the opening or the lumen of the uterus is the ethemus. Right. And so that kind of gives you all the different areas here of the uterine tube. Now you can see basically that it's held in place by three main ligaments. You can see the suspensory ligament here. You can see the broad ligament here. And if you look, there's several different ones, but I'm not, we're not really looking at um, those in particular when we go through here. The only one that I will point out is the mesosalpinix. And basically this, the reason why I put is a little bit different because it is short mesentery that's there versus a typical ligament. Um, and then you can see the ovarian ligament down here. And so these external uterine tube are covered by the peritoneum and again supported by that mesosalpinix. And so that kind of shows you the uterine tube. Now there are some homeostatic imbalances associated with the uterine tube. First of all, there's an ectopic pregnancy. And so this is when the oocyte is fertilized in the peritoneal cavity or that distal uterine tube and begins developing there. Normally aborts naturally with substantial bleeding and it's a lot of pain. And if it doesn't terminate naturally, there is a surgery that has to happen. This can kill you, just to let you know. So it's not something that you want to happen. There's also pelvic inflammatory disease that's um, PID that's a result of this. And it's a spread of infection from the rep, um, reprodu reproductive tract to the peritoneal cavity and may cause scar tissue and lead to infertility. Now you see on um, like packets of Tampax that this is, um, always a warning and it's kind of interesting because um it still happens today but it's not as common as it was say in the early 80s in the early 80s when they made tampons they actually made this absorbent material they no longer use it anymore but they made this absorbent material that was so good at its job that women were using it all day long like they weren't changing routinely, but the problem is that it would absorb um, water and um, solution so well that it would dry out the layer inside of your um, uterus and vagina. And so what would happen is they would pull it out and they take the top layer of that um, tissue with them. And then they put a new one in there and then that tissue would get infected. And then that would lead to a spread into the uterine tubes and PID or PID. Um, so they started warning people of it. They stopped using that kind of absorbent. And that's kind of where all those warnings came from because women did die from that. And so um, just to give you kind of a little um, history on both those homeostatic imbalances. The next part of the duct system is the uterus. And so, this is a hollow, thick wall, basically muscular organ. And its function is basically to receive, retain, and nourish a fertilized ovum. Right? And so there's a position that the uterus can have. It's either antiverted, which is inclined forward, and that's the normal position, or retroverted, which is inclined backwards. And that can basically make having a baby um, extremely difficult. Now, we're just going to talk about this, but I'm going to show it on um, a slide here, a couple slides of forward from here. 
but they do have the region of the uterus. There are different parts. There's the body, which is the main part. There's the fundus, which is the superior rounded region that's above where the uterine tube enters. And think rounded, rounded superior region, just like in the stomach, right? And then the cervix, which is the narrow outlet that protrudes into the actual vagina. And the last part is the small part that's called the cervical canal that's going to essentially communicate with the vagina via external OS and then the uterine body. And so that's the different parts. Now it does have a cervical gland and this gland helps to secrete mucus that will actually block sperm entry. During any time except during the mid cycle. And we're going to talk more about that. Now, there are different walls of the uterus. You have the endometrium, which is basically the mucosal area. And so this is the inner lining, right? And this is what allows for implantation of the fertilized egg. This is what's going to slough off if no pregnancy happens, right? I'm just going to put period here. And that's what's called menses. Myometrium is the middle layer. And this is basically smooth muscle. And this is what contracts during labor. Parametrium is the visceral peritoneum. It's the outermost serious layer. So that's basically um, talking a little bit about the uterus. So let's look at the uterine wall now and specifically look at the endometrium because this is the part where that's going to support life. And this is the part that we lose during menstruation. And so the endometrium, Endometrium actually has two chief layers. And these layers are other known as strata. And so they're the stratum functionalis, which is a functional layer, and the stratum base, basalis, which is the basal layer. So the functional layer actually changes oops, in response to ovarian hormone cycles. So this is what gets shed during menstruation. Now this um, basal layer here is what basically forms a new stratum functionalis after menstruation. So it does, it's unaffected by the hormones. And so you can see both of them here, right? You, here's the functionalis and here's the basalis here, right? And it makes sense. This part is the part that stays behind. This part up here leaves. So how would we remake this? Well, he could, since he's there, can help remake it. Now, if you see underneath all there is that, is that myometrium. And remember, that's that smooth muscle layer that helps to contract during um, pregnancy. So the uterine wall has vascular supply 
the 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 way that the vascular um, or the veins are put together help to supply or plays a key role in the cyclic changes. So just to let you know, the uterine arteries that help supply the blood and the nutrients for the uterine wall arise from the eternal iliac. And basically what that's going to do is it branches into a few types of arteries. You can see here, this is the uterine artery that comes from the internal iliac. And then you can see that this branches here into the, um, the arcuate artery. And um, basically, then that guy is going to branch into, if you look here, the radial artery. Now the radial artery will branch further. You'll see it goes and branches into the straight and the spiral arteries. Now the spiral arteries are important because basically they're located now, if you look, we are in the functionalis here, right? Where the straight arteries are in the bacillus. So these guys, right, are going to help with providing nutrients for those cells that will later make the stratum functionalis. But the spiral arteries are important because they degenerate and regenerate and their spasms what cause shedding of the functionalis layer during menstruation kind of cool isn't it so these guys Extremely important, extremely important. So now let's just look at some of those things that we've talked about in the uterus here. And so let's look at these different regions again and just um, reiterate their importance and what they are. So basically the first thing we're going to do is look at the body and you can see it's that big large layer and this is the main portion, right? And then if you look at that top layer, that's that superior rounded region. And if you look, this is where the uterine tube, the fallopian tubes actually enter. At this point, you can look down here. This is the area that you have the cervix and see how, can you see how it's starting to narrow down and protrude into the actual vagina that's here. And then if you look at this last part right here, you'll look at the um, cervical canal. And that cervical canal is basically going to help in communicating with the um, vagina and the uterine body together. <coughs> and you can see this isthmus that is there and located as well. And if we're looking at the different types of ligaments that are here that help to support the um, uterus, you can see those here, right? You have the mesometrium, the uterosacral ligament, the cardinal or lateral cer um, cervical ligament, and you have the rounded ligament of the uterus. So all of those four guys play a role in helping to um, keep this guy into place. I want to call him a guy, that's kind of funny. And then if you look here, 
they show you the different walls, right? And so you can see on the inside is the endometrium, then that smooth muscle right there that helps in labor contractions, and the peritoneum on the outside. Now there are homeostatic imbalances for the uterus. And a big one is cervical cancer. It affects about 450,000 450, women worldwide each year, killing half. It's most common between the age of 30 and 50. And basically the risk are frequent cervical inflammation. STIs, which you might think of as STDs, and one of the most is HPV, even multiple pregnancies can give you a higher risk. Now there are vaccines provided, three dose vaccines that can help protect against HPV and they're re recommended for about 11 to 12 year old girls. Now how you can detect this, and this is the reason why it's so important to go and get them are pap smears. And basically they're recommended every three years for ages 21 to 30 and every five years for ages 30 to 35. And um, basically included within our HP, HPV test. You can discontinue a lot of time at 65 or after hysterectomy or with sexual inactivity. Um, I would even say these are the recommended and what they state in the book, but I suggest every year, especially if you're sexually active with more than one partner, um, because HPV is so prevalent. Um, some of the stats say up to 92 to 94 percent of the population has contracted HPV at some point in their life. And the problem with it is that it doesn't necessarily have any physical indication that you have it. There aren't, there's not even a good test. There's not a test for men to show that they have it. And a lot of times men will have no signs at all. And the sign that most of the time women have is when they go and get their pap and they get tested for STDs and they put in for HPV or they do the pap smear and um, the pap smear will come back abnormal. They'll do an ELISA test to then see if you have the particular virus associated with it and um, they'll do additional um, kind of microscope assays to look to see if um, you have it. So, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, right? Now, this is not the only homeostatic imbalance. Basically, an unsupported uterus may sink inferiorly until the tip of the cervix protrudes through the external vaginal opening. And what this is known as a prolapse of the uterus. It can be caused It can be caused by overstretching and sometimes tearing of the muscle during childbirth. Um, even though the uterus has many agrine ligaments, it is principally supported by muscles of the pelvic floor, which are prone to damage. Um, chiefly, the urogeneral and pelvic diaphragms that help hold them up. And so basically this is the side view 
that we have looked at and you can see that you have the different areas. So we started with talking about the ovaries that you can see here, Oops. right? And then the little um, finger-like protrusions that help grab the ovum and take them into the uterine tube, right? And basically you have that first part, the infundibulum, right? And then it goes through till you get to the, basically, did I have all the parts on here? It's hard to see. They don't have them all on there until you get into that first part, right? Which is the called the ampulla. And then it goes farther down, right? And then that third part right there is the isthemus, right? Right as it enters. And so then you can see down here the uterus. And you can see it being basically supported here. You can see the round ligament over here. You can see the uterosacral ligament. You can see up here a suspensory ligament of the ovum. Um, You can look over here, the cervix here towards the end of that, um, the covering, the peritoneum that's up here. Um, we've talked about the outside with the clitoris. The uthral, um, uthral um, orifice is right here. And so you can see there's a difference between where we urinate or females urinate and where um, a child forms or, you know, where intercourse happens, where men, it's the same. Now, if you look here, there's that small thing there called um, basically a hymen. And this to see is just kind of this um, mucosa that is near the vi vaginal orifice or opening and it's this complete incomplete partition and then this ends up getting broken during um, intercourse of course the um, small and the major or minor menorah and the majora labia that we talked about earlier Here's the vestibular gland, that's like the vulva um, urethral gland, right? And um, the next thing that we're actually going to talk about, just kind of hit some of these, is the vagina. So let's talk about that really quick. So, this guy extends between the bladder and the rectum from the cervix to the exterior and it serves as the birth canal. In addition to that, it allows for passage for menstrual flow and it's the organ of copulation. Now, it does have several different layers. It has an eventita. It has a muscularis that's incorporated of smooth muscle. And then it has a mucosa, and it has these roots, remember, that help to basically these folds. Um, vaginal secretion, pH changes throughout your life. It's acidic in adulthood, and it's alkaline in adolescence. Now, um, like I said, there is what's known as a hymen. 
And basically, the hymen is an incomplete partition. And this guy gets broken during intercourse. Now, it's not just during intercourse. If you end up using tampons or anything like that, that can break it as well. Now, within the mucosa, there are dendritic cells. And it's thought that they might help to provide a route for HIV transmission. Now, because the uterus tilts away from the vagina, attempts by untrained person to induce an abortion by entering the uterus with the surgical instrument can actually puncture through the posterior wall of the vagina. So you want to make sure um, to have someone who is trained doing those kind of operations because it can end up killing somebody. It can cause hemorrhaging and if the instrument is on sterile, it can cause what's known as peritonitis. Now there is an area called the um, vaginal fornix and this is the upper end of the vagina and this is surrounding the actual cervix. And so just to kind of tell, show you where those are locations, so you can see there the vagina is that major opening towards the top where the cervix is that fornix and then towards the bottom area kind of protecting it is that hymen. Now another part that we didn't really have to discuss for men are the mammary glands. And these mammary glands are basically modified sweat glands. And they consist of about 15 to 25 lobes. And the lobules within these lobes contain granular alveoli. And these guys produce milk. And basically the milk is passed into the lactiferous ducts and then into the sinuses that open to the outside at the nipple. These are both present in men and, fem men and women, but they're normally just functional in females. Now, in the female, if they're non-nursing, These glandular structures are undeveloped. Now around the nipple is the um, areola and this is the pigmented skin that surrounds the nipple. And basically you have suspensory ligaments that attach to the breast to the underlying muscle to keep the mammary glands in place. So we can look at this really quick, right? And so you have these big lobes here, right? And within them, do you see all those circles? Those are the lo lobules that contain the alveoli. Now, when it goes to actually make milk from there, they get made in there and they pass into the duct right, into this area, the sinus. Now you can see that you have the pectoralis muscle here and that basically these lobules and all this are attached to that muscle here through the suspensatory ligaments. So that's what the lactating mammary gland structure looks like. Now there is a homeostatic imbalance for breasts as well, and that's breast cancer. Now,
Okay. Um, this is an invasive breast cancer. That's the most common malignancy. It usually arises from the epithelial cells of the smallest ducts that eventually metastasize, which moves to the rest of the body. It is the second most common cause of cancer death in U.S. women. So the risk factors are early onset of menstruation and late menopause. No pregnancy or first pregnancy late in life. No or short periods of breastfeeding. Or family history of breast cancer. Seventy percent of women with breast cancer have no risk factors. Ten percent of them are due to hereditary defects. There are mutations in the genes BRCA1 and 2. Basically, 50 to 80% of women with these genes develop breast cancer. This also increases the risk of ovarian cancer. Now, how you diagnose breast cancer, early detection is self-examination, and that's why when you start getting well women checks, they'll ask you if you're doing this, and if you don't know how to do it, they will show you, and mammograms, which is a type of examination. Now, the American Cancer Society recommends screening every year for women over 40. Um, the U.S. Prevention Service Task Force on Breast Cancer Screening recommends delaying mammograms until age 50 but it's still the norm to do them at age 40. The diagnostic MRI recommended, um, it's only recommended for women of high risk factors. And so here on the right, you can see the mammogram procedure. It is not a friendly, happy procedure to do. Um, they essentially put the breast between two plates and squish it and try to get as much in there to squish it and then they, um, you have to stand there for a few moments while they scan it. And you can see on the left on B that they're showing you a film of a normal breast. And then you can see the malignancy there in the film of the breast with the actual tumor. And your treatment depends on the characteristics of the lesion. Um, Basically, until the 1970s, standard treatment was radical mastectomies that removed the breast with all underlining muscles, fascia, and associated lymph nodes. Um, there's also 
a lumpectomy that's less invasive and just takes out the cancerous lump. Um, let me go back in here. And I'm going to put LN for lymph nodes. So that's what they did till the 70s. Now, um, when they're looking at characteristics of lesions, right, how they treat it, they can treat with radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery. It's often followed by, if you do radiation, ra I mean surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy to try to destroy any stray cells. There are drugs for estrogen responsive cancers. So you have Herceptin, that's for aggressive cancer cells. Um, tamoxifen, which improves outcome for premenopausal women with early or late stage cancer. Or Femora, which reduces occurrences. And like I said, um, a common surgery that they did until the 70s was the radical mastectomy. Um, Lumpectomies basically is less invasive and it only takes the cancerous lump. And simple mastectomies basically remove breast tissue and auxiliary lymph nodes. And a lot of times, or sometimes, Women opt for breast reconstruction after this to help them feel more comfortable going back into society after all of this is over. So we're done with part three of this lecture. And um, we will continue with the last part, which is female physiology.